My pleasure to baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary, the hymn baptism, raise the wall. Are you with me? Amen. 
See, because sometimes it's just an easier thing to throw a label on someone than to put forth the effort to reach them right where they are. Yet for us and what we've been studying and what we've been talking about and the Christ that we claim to follow, His message is sure. And this is what He said in Luke 5, 32. I have not come to call righteous people, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Folks, that's the name of the game. And this ain't a game. I mean, it's serious business. It, it, it hinges on eternal life and where folks spend eternity in one or two places. But I just want you to understand something this morning is that that is our goal. That is our ambition is to reach as many people with the life-changing news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to help them understand that it doesn't matter what label the world has tacked on to you, folks, that through Jesus Christ you can be changed. Amen. See, we're not trying to just gather the saints into the house. We are trying to find those who need a touch from God. We're trying to locate those who have been labeled and rejected and tell them that the God of heaven loves them and sees them differently than man sees them. Some folks have been labeled damaged goods, folks. But I'm here to tell you that that's not how God looks at you at all. Right. That's not how God looks at anyone. That's not what God thinks about anybody. I mean, we know that God sees us entirely differently. Uh, entirely different. He looks at us in an entirely different way. What do you mean, Brother Jeff? Uh, see, this is where the church even fails to take into account sometimes is that God sees you differently than you see yourself. I preached a sermon uh, a few weeks back and I talked about the two blind men and how they both need to be able to see. Listen, I, I believe every person needs to see themselves right where they are. As a matter of fact, that's my heartbeat for this revival that's coming up. I pray that every person that sits through these revival services or even right now that's sitting under my voice, that God would open your eyes and you would acknowledge right where you are because that is when God can work. That is when God can move. When a man or a woman or a boy or a girl uh, their heart is humbled. They're, 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 they recognize the fact that they are sinful before God. Listen, we need to see God in all the holiness, holiness that He has. Amen. Amen. We need to see ourselves right where we are. Because He would change us. He would change us to get into the presence of God that way. But the church even fails to recognize it. See, there are folks out there right now, listen, that feel that they are worthless and hopeless. But you want you know something? According to the Word of God, you have untold value. Man. If somebody might say, well, Brother Jeff, I, this sounds awful uh, feel good. No, I want you to understand something. I don't care what label's been tacked on you. I know how God feels about you. God's not left that open to question. God has, has shown us. And listen, whatever your reputation is, listen, I want you to understand who it is that has taken your place. I want you to understand who it is that poured out their blood upon the cruel cross. It is the God of heaven. Amen. It is the God of heaven that chose to bear your sins upon the tree. It is the God of heaven who took the stripes. And the Bible says, by those stripes you are healed. Amen. It is the God of heaven. No less, no less is he than the God of heaven. In Philippians 2, 6, and 8, uh, 6 through 8, it says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but look what it said, but made himself of no reputation. <laughs> made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He gave up his reputation, folks. Now you say, well, Brother Jeff, what, what could that possibly have looked like? Let me tell you something. He's God. And he was worshipped in heaven for being God. He was worshipped for who he was and what he had done. Even the Old Testament saints worshipped him. And I, I'm not talking about just in, in, in going to the church or to the temple and sacrificing. I'm talking about that some of the, the saints of old that we read about really worshipped him for who he was. Yeah. But even in all that glory and all that honor that he is so deserving of, because he is a holy, righteous, sinless God. Listen. Because he is a selfless. 
sacrificial God. Who is worthy of the worship of all those who bow before Him. See, He gave up His heavenly home, became like us, walked among us, died in our place. And He says to us by that act on the cross that you have eternal value and eternal worth. And He spared no expense to prove that to us. But I can't help but tell you that part of, of God seeing, seeing you differently uh, than you see yourself is you have to understand as well that not only does God see you differently is that you're not, you're not worthless. You're not hopeless to Him. You have value and worth. But the other part of that is this. God sees when no one else sees and God sees where no one else sees. And I think that is the part that the church really misses. And I use that term church loosely at the moment. To mean only those who profess to be God's people. Because we often forget this, but we do well to remember. And it was so funny because we're sitting there in Sunday school class and, and studying Proverbs. And, and all at once, Donnie mentioned this verse. He says, 1 Samuel 16, 7. I have it in my notes for today. It says, but the Lord said unto Samuel. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Why is it so imperative for the church to recognize this? I'm going to be quite frank this morning. We spend a whole lot of time Making sure that what everyone sees jives with what we've been saying we possess. <clears throat> what do you mean, Brother Jeff? We want to sound good. We want to sound holy. We want to sound righteous when we're around other people. When we're around people who profess to know God. We want to talk to talk, walk to walk. But let me tell you something. If you're having to fake it, God knows. And the only person you're fooling is yourself. <coughs> you're fooling yourself. Because God doesn't look at you like anyone else looks at you. God is considering your inward thoughts and your emotions and your acts. God knows the very desires of your heart, folks. That's right. We can paint it up. We can dress it up. We can act it up. Yep. But if you ain't got it, you ain't got it. Amen. And you can blow it off. And here's the thing. I hear this so much. I hear this so much. And this is why I say what I say about my heart being for revival. But I hear this so much. We blow off wrongs that exist. And that's just those folks' reputation. That's just how they are. That's just who they are. And that's no big deal. And even they have convinced themselves that that's just their personality. That's just how they are. Yet God sees through all of that. Right. Maybe the problem is, is that sin is coming out and is really only evidenced by what is inside them. And so, to be quite honest, as God began dealing with my heart about this message, it made me take a deeper look at this idea of a reputation. Because now it's not just a label that the world has put on you, but my question would be this to those who profess to know Christ this morning. What is your reputation before God? How does God look at you if you claim to belong? If God were to speak to you right now directly, what would He say? See, here's the idea that the church has. The church has this idea that you pray the prayer, join the church, get baptized, and when you get to heaven, you will hear those sought-after, magical words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. But can I tell you that it's not that simple? Oh, that'll get you through the game, folks. I'm not worried about folks who 
believe on Jesus Christ, put all their faith in Him, and get back. Because I'm not worried about them getting to the game. My concern is for those who may not really have what it takes to get through the game. I mean, what if, it, what if it is this this morning, that how you view yourself is not at all how God views you? What if your reputation before God is far different than how you see yourself? What if it is this morning that you have fooled yourself and only yourself? That don't happen, do you? Take Peter from instance. Simon Peter. <coughs> it appears by all accounts that he is one of the most dedicated of the disciples. Even to the death, I will go with you. No matter what. Jesus looked at him. Jesus is God in the flesh, folks. And he looks at him and you know that his heart had to go out to him thinking, Peter, I know you think you've got this great big faith. This mega faith that, 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 that even the devil can't scare you. But he said, Peter, before the cock crows, you deny me three times. And that is exactly what Peter did. Exactly. Because God knows you better than you know yourself. Yep. And matter of fact, Peter even denied the Lord Jesus Christ to a little girl. This one who could never dream of deserting Christ for fear of his own life said, I don't know him. I don't know him. He didn't curse. See, folks, if if our view is not what God views us as, if our, if our desire is for God to change us, then something must occur. We have to humble ourselves and ask God to show us how we are. Help us, God, to see ourselves the way you see us. See, we have to make a choice that we want our reputation to be different than it has been. And God's Word gives us insight into what I'm talking about when it says in Proverbs 22, 1, that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Literally, the Bible says that we're to choose a good reputation over anything that money could buy or all the money that we could possess. But I want you to hear me this morning. Just because you've been labeled by the world as one thing, or even because you have stumbled in your walk and developed a reputation before God, you need to understand the most marvelous truth of God's Word. He can change that. He can change that. As a matter of fact, we find in the pages of God's Word some folks that we consider heroes of the faith. I've already mentioned one of them. But not all of them started out right and some of them even stumbled in the midst of their walk and gained another reputation. Tony Evans, he points out eight people specifically from God's Word that had a reputation that we'd be like, what? Listen to this list. Rahab was a harlot. Jonah was a rebel. Moses was a murderer. Sarah was a doubter. Peter was an apostate. Esther was a diva. Samson was a player. And Jacob was a deceiver. Yeah. And we don't think about all those things about those people all the time because we look most of the time to the positive side of them and say, wow, look what people they became for God. They didn't always do that. See, here's the thing, folks. It's not about how you start sometimes. As far as life's concerned. We talk about starting well as a child of God and finishing well as a child of God. But it's not always about how your life got started. Your childhood may have been completely messed up. You may have even had some teenage and adult years that didn't go quite well. But listen, 
it's not about how you get started in life, nor is it even always about what happens in the middle. But I can guarantee you one thing. It is about how you finish. It is absolutely about how you finish. And that is exactly why in Hebrews 12, 1, the writer says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by with, about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. What does it say? The evidence is all around us about how God changes lives. We've been preaching for weeks now that we need to renew our passion for the lost. We need to get out there and tell folks about Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that they understand that they can be forgiven. Listen, you and I as Christians need to understand that we can be forgiven. Amen. Some folks fall down in the Christian faith and they think, well, what's the point? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. God wants you to get up and dust yourself off and get back to living for Him. Amen. Amen. He wants to help you. He forgive you if you just confess your sin. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And I just love how Isaiah wraps up Isaiah 62 here in verses 6 and 7 when he says this. Isaiah wraps this up with, I have set watchmen upon thy wall, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. You that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, and give Him no rest till He establish, until He made Jerusalem a praise in the earth. 